This is the Summer Technology Program at Bryan Community School, and this is the first week of four sessions. And I am teaching claymation, which is a combination of art-based skills with computer technology. So students are allowed to create storyboards and characters out of clay, and then take what they've learned and use digital photography and digital software to create basically movies. Even though we're in a digital world, I still like to kind of bring out the, the basic sketching and brainstorming skills for these kids. So they had to come up with their characters through sketching and storyboards, which I think even in the digital world is an important part of just being prepared as, a, as an artist. Um, but I, I like the idea of being able to utilize many tools, um, not only hand-making tools, but computer and digital tools. And this allows both for uh, a one-week course, and I think the kids really enjoy it. I like for them to be able to problem solve. Um, my rule always is you have to try it first before I can help you. So uh, a lot of these students come in here with the background knowledge and how to use some of these programs already. But they're able to use things like Photoshop and iMovie, something they may not use on a regular basis. And I think it just helps them stay involved with um, using the creative imagination throughout the summertime and just something to keep them busy and having fun in the summer as well. In Climation, we literally first um, make things out of clay and then we put them into a video which is soon can, which is like a trailer to a movie. We usually work in groups of three or four and we um, think of a think of a movie and we make a trailer about it. Probably the most fun is either editing the, um, the trailer or taking the pictures. My film is called The Adventures of the Amazing Bouncer, a superhero who comes to Earth to stop a bad guy named Dr. Madness from destroying the Earth. This week, we started off just um, writing our storyboards, making our characters, and then starting, mostly everyone here started taking pictures. Then probably like by the second day, they finished taking pictures and start editing. And editing takes a long time, especially for my group. We had about 316 photos. We have been diving into groups to make mini clay trailers or movies that are like one to two minutes long. And we've been learning how to do stop motion with clay with computers, Photoshop, iMovies, stop motion. So in our movie, um, a person and their little sibling go find a portal, they go into it, and when they come out, they are pandas. Hello, this is Galactic Patrol. We need your help on planet Earth. Staff, I'll be there. Dr. Maniac, you will die. We'll see about that. Laser eye. Ah, my arm. Ah. Attack! Attack! This meeting of the Lincoln Board of Education for June 25th, 2019 is called to order. April, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer? Here. Mrs. Danick? Here. Mrs. Duncan? Here. Mr. Mayhew? Present. Ms. Memgard? Here. Dr. Rahner? Present. Mr. Boswell? Present. The Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted and available at the entrance of the room. We have minutes from our work session on June 11th our regular meeting on June 11th, our board retreat on June 12th, and our public forum on June 13th. Are there any additions or corrections? 
Seeing none, all sets of minutes are approved as published. Tonight we have a student celebration, Girl Up. High school enrichment opportunities through Lincoln Public Schools offer significant lessons in leadership. Samavi Rafiq, who will be a junior at Lincoln East High School this fall and who leads the LPS chapter of Girl Up, will share lessons learned as one of the major organizers of the Girl Up Nebraska Leadership Summit that was early in June. Hi, my name is Samavi Rafiq. I'm very excited to come speak about this event we had today. And I've also been advised to introduce my parents who are with me here today in the back. Um, so this event that we put on was called the Girl Up Nebraska Leadership Summit, and the group that I'm a part of that organized it is called the Girl Up Nebraska Coalition. And we run in conjunction with the Girl Up Organization, um, which for those of you who are not familiar with what that is, it's a campaign of the United Nations Foundation that works to um, fight for gender equality and women and girls' rights, and is very involved in um, involving adolescent girls in that fight. So. The Girl Up Nebraska Coalition, which started up just this past year, and it's made up of nine high school girls from the Lincoln and Omaha area, and our main duty is to oversee the different Girl Up chapters within Nebraska, like the one at Lincoln Public Schools and Marion and Millard North within Omaha, and to organize this summer conference. So the Leadership Summit um, was hosted June 10th and 11th in Lincoln, Nebraska, down at the UNL campus, and we ha um, this is our first large-scale event, and so we had about 60 attendees come from the Lincoln, Omaha, and Grand Island area, and it was open to ages 12 to 22, so we had a lot of middle schoolers and high schoolers there. And there was a registration fee for this event, but thanks to our sponsors, we were able to provide um, financial aid to make it as open and accessible as possible. And so what it was, it was an opportunity for girls who are um, interested in gender equality, women and girls' rights, to come and learn from um, um, local um, female ch change makers and engage in skill-based workshops to learn more about those issues. So, day one of the Leadership Summit, the speakers that we had are listed on the screen, but I'm going to talk about um, and highlight a few of the most important ones from day one. So first we had Megna Malapon. She is a youth mental health advocate, and she talked about the intersection between feminism and mental health. We also had Gargash Takatawaji. She was one of our most popular speakers, and she was um, the youngest woman elected to the Afghani parliament, and she was also came to the United States as a refugee. So she shared her experiences to both of those things. And then we also had Linda Graham, who of course is um, model Ashley Graham's mother. She shared her experiences with what it was like to raise a model and what it's like to be a paraeducator for Lincoln Public Schools. And then we also had um, from day two, um, Danielle Conrad, who is a former Nebraska legislator and she was the, she's currently the director of the Nebraska ACLU, talk about her experiences and work with advocacy. Um, and we had Mayor um, Gail Rivera come and do a question and answer session with the audience. And she answered most of the questions um, were about what it was like to run for office as a female and um, what her plan is now that she's mayor to help empower Lincoln's women and girls. We also had Inspire sessions on day two in which she broke up the group into small groups of about five to eight girls and talked about things like body image and the history of feminism and women in sports and kind of discussed topics that aren't often discussed openly. So we were all very pleased with how this event went. It was our first large-scale event, so we were not super optimistic at all the time, but it came out, it went together very well. So I'd like to share a few takeaways with someone who helped organize it and is an event attendee. Um, first of all, this event was an opportunity to um, teach the girls that came social skills. Most of the girls would come in the morning and they wouldn't know anyone else in the room. So we would introduce them to someone, and it was amazing to see how just by lunchtime, they were swapping Instagram handles and posing for pictures with other girls there. It was also an opportunity for me personally to, to learn a lot about leadership through planning the event. The other um, state officers and I would spend our weeks learning to plan budgets and design websites and advertise using social media. And it was an opportunity to embrace diversity and the different, different skill sets and talents that everyone else brought to the table. Um, above all else, I think that the speakers and the topics that we discussed helped to um, emphasize the connection between global issues and local issues, especially in considering how real-world events apply to Nebraska communities. For example, in school we can talk about the refugee crisis or women in government, but I think it is far more impactful and eye-opening to have someone come and share their own experiences firsthand, as we had Gargash to do when she talked about what it was like to um, lead in the Afghani parliament and be a refugee in the United States. We also provided these girls with um, role models that were from the local Lincoln community to learn from. We had women come that were involved in the arts and in STEM and um, the cooking industry and nonprofit work and politics. 
but made sure that it was um, provided and presented in a nonpartisan and non-polarizing way. Um, lastly, I think that all of these things go hand in hand with school in the sense that it allows students a way to take the skills and information used in school and implement them in a real world, real world setting and further hone in on those soft skills. School teaches a lot of the hard skills, but things like communication and leadership and teamwork and public speaking are also very important. And this is an opportunity to further develop those. Um, and in the end, Girl Up provides a safe and supportive and empowering community for many girls, as it does for me personally, to take action alongside each other, and that's also very important. So thank you again for this opportunity to come share. I'd love to answer any questions if you have them. Board members? Annie? Of course I'm going to have a question. <laughs> Um, Girl Up is close to my heart, my daughter is Sophia Olson, and um, she did Girl Up uh, the first year and helped kind of get a jump off, the, get a jump up. My question is, kind of like, where do you see, or what would be a way, where, where do you see Girl Up going, and what kind of support would be helpful to you in um, helping it to grow further? Yeah, so the main thing that we're looking to do this year is expand to more schools. The Lincoln Public Schools chapter that I run is, um, we are mainly in schools that are in like this area of town. We'd love to expand to schools in lower socioeconomic areas too in our work. So I think helping to um, get the word out about Girl Up to different school leaders in those areas would be very helpful to help us expand and reach more girls. And what about next year? Is this going to happen again? Um, yes, the summit is, um, look, we're looking to have it be an annual event. So we're working on planning it for next year too. Well, congratulations. It looks like it was a fantastic event, and um, it's a very needed activity for us to do. As you said, we do hard skills and we need soft skills, and mm -hmm. the world needs it where we mix the two. So, yes, thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. So, uh, thank you very much for coming and presenting to us tonight. My question would be, uh, if, if I were a student and I wanted to attend this, how do I find out more? Uh, how would I register to attend next yeah, year? Yeah, so our website and social media is the best way to um, get information on this. We did a lot of our advertising through those two medians, so mm -hmm. that's probably the best way to get involved. Or you can always contact a member or a state officer to learn more about it. Okay, and your website is? Um, it's girlupne.org. Girlupne.org. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. And Kathy? So have you worked through any of the, like, the community learning centers to maybe do a club in the schools? Do you have that connection? <laughs> yeah, so Girl Up LPS has elementary and middle school after school clubs at schools through L LPS. So we work with CLC at some of those schools to help um, organize those and plan them. And if students don't have a CLC and they don't know about Girl Up, what other kind of outreach do you do for them? Um, so are you talking about like high schoolers or like younger age? Well, I'm thinking younger kids might, might be more inspired at a younger age if we found a way to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on our website we have a way that you can request a club at a school if you're at that school and it's not there. And we're also looking to do more events um, that are community based and targeted toward a younger age. Um, one that we have in works right now is an advocacy day that we would, um, we were going to be working with senators, mm -hmm. um, like local senators to pull it off and it would be for elementary, like fifth graders and um, sixth graders to attend. So if I had your website and I wanted to get communications from you so I could show this I have eight granddaughters, or eight <laughs> grandchildren, six of them are girls. So if I wanted to get your information to them, do you have a place that I could get like a newsletter from that? Yeah, um, I would go to our chapter website, that's girlupLPS.org, and there's information on the LPS chapter there. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Well again, thank you so much for coming tonight. Yes, thank you. Our next item is public comment. Blue cards are available at the entrance for those wishing to speak. Each speaker is allowed five minutes and may provide printed materials to the board. Please begin your remarks by introducing yourself and I will inform you when one minute remains. I have one blue card tonight and our first speaker is Joel Peterson representing Samson Construction. Great. Board members and President Boswell and Superintendent Joel. Uh, my name is Joel Peterson. Uh, I am here representing Samson Construction. I'm here to talk about agenda item 9.2.2, a big important public project, uh, potentially up to two new high schools. Um, if you don't know, I've, I've been an attorney in public sector for most of my career. I started in the city attorney's office and then worked in the University of Nebraska. I was general counsel at the University of Nebraska for 10 years. Um, 
I've known Matt Graff through the Bar Association. Uh, Matt is the in-house counsel at Samson. Uh, he asked me to take a look at uh, what you're considering today, primarily because of the disparity in the bids. You've got a $587,000 bid and a $5,175,000 bid. Uh, that will get people's attention. Um, you know, today, I think what I'm here to do is respectfully ask, appreciating what you have before you and the decisions on this important public project, you want to do it right. Because this is up for a bond vote later, I think you have time to give this some further consideration. Uh, the main thing I'm worried about, uh, and what we would request, is a delay until the next board meeting. Uh, which would give me an opportunity to have a further dialogue with staff and understand better uh, about what I learned today, which is that uh, apparently the discrepancy at least is partly explained by a donation. Now I will tell you what I'm used to is those are disclosed and that's what happened in the zoo project. I talked to Jim about that. Uh, there was actually a line in the instruction for the proposers uh, for a cash contribution and an in-kind contribution. Uh, it was disclosed, it was asked for, and requested. That didn't happen. Um, and this is a hard bid. Most of the time when I do see them at risk, you do an RFP. But you've got an IFB, an invitation for bid. So this is hard bid. There's less flexibility uh, when you do that. Uh, and I understand that, but from my perspective, the concern and the reason we're asking for a delay to have further conversation and, uh, and understand this is, yes, I'm here represent, representing the second place bidder, but that's because I'm in private practice now. I need a client. Uh, this is, uh, my client, Samson, is participating in this, so in full disclosure. Um, for us, the characterization of a donation matters here. Uh, and if it's undisclosed and you can't read what's in the agenda item or frankly what was submitted as part of the bid and find out how much that bid is, how much that donation is. You don't know. Is it the difference between 587000 and the high bid? Is it the difference between 587000 and 2.7, which is Samson's bid? We don't know. And so the reason I'm here today is just to get a conversation started to ask some hard questions because it's important to do CM at risk right, uh, to do the project on time and on budget, uh, and I think there's time to do that. So that's my request. Questions? All right. Thank you very much. I do not have any other blue cards, but is there anyone else who wishes to come forward and address the board at this time? Seeing none, we will move on to the consent agenda. Are there any items to be pulled from the consent agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion for approval? Kathy? I would move approval of consent items for human resources, uh, routine business, optional enrollment for student applications, and late requests for option out. Is there a second, Barb? I second. Are there any questions, comments, or conflict statements? Seeing none, April, would you please call the roll on the motion to approve the consent agenda? Dr. Ronger? Yes. Ms. Byer? Yes. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Our next item of business is item 9.11, policy 5110. Uh, Barb. And if we want, we can take a Policy 5345 item 912 at the same yeah. time. Why don't we do that? Um, this is for first reading. These are uh, changes to our policies that are required by either federal or state law. I will turn this over to uh, Matt Larson to explain uh, what the changes are. Thank you. Policy 5110 is an existing policy pertaining to student admission procedures. We recommend a small addition to that existing policy as required by LB 115. LB 115 requires that we permit children of parents who have received military orders that they will be stationed in the state of Nebraska to
to allow us to preliminarily enroll their students in the district. Policy 5345 is a new policy which is required by LB 575. LB 575 requires school districts to provide military recruiters with access to directory information of students in high school. I do want to point out that a student's parent can request via writing that their student's information not be shared with military recruiters. Parents are informed via the important information uh, handbook and in the packet of information they receive at the start of the school year that they can opt out from sharing this information. This has actually been our long-standing practice in the Lincoln Public Schools. LB 575 essentially requires us to create uh, our procedure in policy and that's what you see before you now. Are there any questions? Kathy. I have a couple questions that I've been asked by constituents. Is there a deadline date for parents to submit this request? No. Do they need to make these requests annually or can they make them at the start of ninth grade and for their entire participation in LPS? Once their request is made, it is noted in our student information system Synergy and it follows the student for the rest of their time in high school and would follow them should they move from one high school to a different high school. So the request only has to be made one time. If students are wards of the state, how do we handle and protect students' rights if they do not have an adult advocate in their lives? Every student has some form of an adult advocate. And for example, if they're living in a group home, they may have a caseworker or a foster home, they have a foster parent. The only student who wouldn't have an advocate would be a student who has been legally emancipated. In that particular case, that student can act on his or her own behalf. And I think you answered this, but I'm going to ask it again just to make sure parents hear it. How does this vary from our practices and procedures with respect to military recruiters? It doesn't. Perfect. Annie? Um, <clears throat> is there a possibility to make it an opt-in option versus an opt-out? Mm, that's a legal question. My opinion would be no. The way the uh, LB is worded is it's worded that way so you can't do the reverse and that was I believe intentional on the part of the, the lawmakers. So this uh, policy is written very much in the way in which the, um, the LB was written, correct? It basically copies it. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Then I do have another question. So <clears throat> this brought up for me the question of how do students, how do parents be able to opt in or opt out of other, because here we say it's our, like our um, practice, uh, same access as we give to post-secondary edu educational institutions or prospective employers of such students. So I looked up our policy, and that's policy 5360. And in that policy, we only have a two-week time period in which you can choose to opt out. So I'm going to request that, I think this would go to student learning, correct? Okay. Yeah. That we would take a look at why we have a two-week time period yeah. to opt out versus this one, which would be, if you don't want it, you can choose when you don't want to be opt-in or opt-out. Perhaps we'll get the process on why and so forth, because um, I, I think that's a, a good idea. That you should be able to change your mind. And I see the chair of student learning nodding, yes. so yeah. we'll let the committee take that up. That, that is my two questions. With that. Uh, any further questions or comments on this item? All right. Seeing none, uh, these two items will come back to us at our next meeting. That brings us to item 9.1.3, land acquisition. Don. Uh, I would like to uh, turn this over to Dr. Standish. You bet. Before you this evening, you have a land purchase. Um, this is a purchase of land that is approximately 19.15 acres. It is $1.1 million approximately and it is intended future, long-term, for an elementary site. It does give us positioning on the east corridor, um, about 98th and Van Dorn streets, and this has been discussed um, with planning committee and is brought to you this evening. We'd be okay. happy to answer any questions, and I know Mr. Wieskamp would be happy to come up as well. Okay, questions or comments from board members? And again, to clarify, uh, this particular site is not part of the current recommendations uh, for the Tier 1 of the 10-year facility plan? 
this site is not listed on either the original staff update to the 10-year plan that was presented to the board um, last November, December, mm -hmm. um, and it is not on what's being considered by the superintendent's facility advisory for the next bond issue. Okay. Um, the vision for this piece of land is longer term than that as the Stevens Creek area builds out over a period of years. Okay, so someone seeing the meeting tonight or reading about this in the paper and, and drawing a conclusion that, oh, that's where one of those new elementary schools Schools is going to be shouldn't draw that conclusion correct all right thank you uh, this item will also come back to us at our next meeting that brings us uh, to item 9.2.1 the 2019-2020 Board of Education and Superintendent annual goals and priorities so of course the board and exec team met at our annual retreat on June 12th to discuss the upcoming year and our meeting was facilitated by Larry Sternberg, and I would like to thank him and Talent Plus for their work in helping us identify these annual goals. We have important work ahead of us this year with a focus on two main areas, facilities and equity. The proposed board and superintendent goals for 2019-20 are, number one, to accommodate growth and ensure that existing facilities are efficient and well-maintained by December 31st, 2019, review the Superintendent Facility Advisory Committee recommendations, update the 10-year facility and infrastructure plan, and determine the next steps for addressing facility and infrastructure needs, including high school capacity. And goal number two, to support academic success and improve equitable outcomes for all students, by April 15th, 2020, in partnership with students, staff, and the community, create a common definition of equity and develop a framework for monitoring and continuously improving equity in Lincoln Public Schools. The first goal keeps the district on track to request funding to address facility and infrastructure needs with a potential bond issue in early 2020. The Superintendent's Facility Advisory Committee plans to make its recommendations to Dr. Joel in late August. The board and executive team will review these recommendations update the 10-year plan and determine the next steps. The second goal sets the stage for the district to continuously improve equitable outcomes for all students year after year. Equity will not be achieved overnight or even with one year's work. By proposing this goal, our board is acknowledging that this work will be ongoing and that to truly make progress in narrowing achievement gaps, we must be intentional in our definitions and our process. As we did with our strategic plan, we will do this work in partnership with our students, staff, and the community. At this point, I'd open it up for any discussion. Barb. I um, don't want to uh, diminish goal number one, which is incredibly important to a growing district, but I do want to go and highlight the uh, equity um, goal. Uh, I particularly like that we're starting from ground zero with the definition, which I think is terrific. And um, I think that Lincoln uh, is a community that has always supported equity in its facilities and programming throughout the district, and that's the reason why we have a really good school district. But to give this renewed and refreshed attention it's just um, very inspiring to me, and I'm looking forward to working with my board peers in the community in pursuing, pursuing these goals and uh, with Dr. Joel, of course, and his leadership, his fine leadership. So thank you very much. Thanks, Barb. Other comments or questions? Kathy? I think we've looked at equity and equality under the same lens for a long time. And that in itself is part of the issue. Equal and equitable are not necessarily defined the same. I think one of my colleagues described it the best. Equal means everybody gets exactly the same. Equitable means everybody gets exactly what they need. And we need to figure out how to hone that in. And for us to make sure those resources are avail available, we have to have that hard conversation. Interestingly enough, all over the country, this seems to be the conversation. And I think we're heads and shoulders ahead of a lot of our peers in other districts. So I want to thank my colleagues for coming together and, and making this a goal, because it is something we pursue to work together. Thank you, Kathy. Annie? Um, I want to you know, 
pretty excited about both these goals because was sitting at the table to help us create them. But I also want to point out that um, I, I um, also am very excited about um, taking some time to, and literally taking the time to say what does equity mean at L LPS? Because that is really kind of the question we will start asking and, and what is it, and the partnerships that we need. But I want to add to this that Though it's not written here, we must remember we have many other important things happening at LPS that are not in our goals, which one is the ERP. Again, I always feel that should be redefined, but the, um, the computer um, upgrade and so forth, that's really important work that helps us with these both of these goals. The other one was our continuing class program with our technology, which also goes right into these goals and so forth. And those are just the two off the top of my head that I just want us to remember that though we may not have them down here, it doesn't mean they're any less important. It means that that work is ongoing and kept in our vision, but our vision needs to expand constantly for us to continue to be the uh, place where we want our kids to go and learn and become good citizens. So I just want to put that out there so um, any staff listening won't be going, what, well, did they forget about us? <coughs> no, we did not. Um, we know that that's under fine hands and that it needs to continue to move forward. Thank you, Annie. Dr. Joel? Well, I think another way of looking at that is, you know, we still have our strategic plan that drives all, all of the work of the system. But I so appreciate uh, the commitment that the Board of Education makes annually to sit down and we look at our strat plan, we look at our results from the year before, we have candid and casual conversations about where do we want the district to go, and every year we come up with two or three strategic priorities, and what they mean to myself and to the, the folks that I get to work with, these are the all hands on deck priorities. So at the end of the year, we want to be able to produce information and process and hopefully some outcomes that address these. And I think that's, uh, that's indicative of a, of a school district that stays on page, but doesn't lose sight of the fact that we've got a whole bunch of other things we're responsible for, too. Thank you, Dr. Joel. Don. Uh, first, I just wanted to say that I thought we had uh, some really substantive conversations at the retreat uh, that I very much appreciated. Uh, and I uh, agree with uh, what Barb said. I think that in terms of uh, student experiences, uh, but also in terms of hiring practices, I think that equity is very important uh, to our staff, and I do think that uh, we do a good job. Uh, but a number of years ago, we uh, talked for a while about the concept of moving from good to great. And I think that this is uh, a statement uh, by, the, by the district uh, that we're not satisfied with good enough and that we want to take a leadership position. Uh, and so I, uh, I very much appreciate the uh, work that the leadership team did and the staff did to turn our conversations into a, uh, a succinct uh, set of goals uh, that I'm very supportive of. Thank you, Don. Any other comments or questions? Right. This item will come back to us at our next meeting. <coughs> next item on our agenda is item 9.2.2, construction manager is constructor services for new high schools. Dr. Standish. Yes, I will ask that Scott Wieskamp come up to the podium and answer some questions. Um, you will notice, and I think we should give some context to the conversation that previously occurred about action tonight. This is, as traditional, um, first reading from the superintendent. I will share that staff has had conversations. <laughs> Our original intent was to have the construction manager and the tar architect and engineer on board and adopted this evening. Um, we do have a series of meetings and um, aggressive work in front of us. So that is why staff has entertained and asked the board to entertain the idea that if you feel your questions are sufficiently answered this evening and would entertain a motion to move in one meeting, um, that is where that energy and request comes from. Is That was originally the desire of staff, um, continues to be the desire of staff, so that we can move forward with project planning for the potential of high schools and new high school spaces in Lincoln, which we're all very excited about. So we know there's a wide variation in the bid. That was the result of the two-week delay, um, was some vetting of that process. And other than that, Scott Wieskamp can kind of walk you through the process. And we're open for conversation and dialogue and questions that you have this evening. We also have representatives from Hausman that have joined us that we're very grateful for. Um, so we'll see what questions you have and who the appropriate person is to answer that question. Thank you, Liz. Scott. I might step back in time a little bit because as uh, Dr. Standish referenced earlier, the superintendent's facility advisory committee has been meeting since January. 
And about that same time, uh, we brought to the attention of the planning committee about the idea of hiring the architect and CM for the high school projects ahead of a bond issue that you have yet to set. That's still an unknown. And for one or two high schools, still unknown, even though we know there are recommendations that are out there. And so this was good planning on our part that we felt that we needed to move this process forward. And I think the number that we threw at you is between two and three million dollars if we could start that planning process ahead of the bond issue, hoping for the success of a bond issue and opening that first high school in 2022. So that behind us, we, uh, we engaged the architects in December of last year. We engaged um, contractors in February, and then we engaged them all again in early April as we brought this process forward. And so in parallel, we wanted to hire the architect team and the CM uh, with a limited scope of services. I think we had proposed to you uh, no more than a half a million dollars combined investment pre-bond. And that's the way the invitation for bid was presented to the CM and the RFP for professional services for the design team. So that process began April 11th. The, those documents were released. We had a pre-submittal meeting uh, with both groups before they submitted their bids and or their uh, proposals. Um, we followed that up with uh, uh, interviews, uh, shortlisted and did interviews. Uh, two weeks ago, you had the recommendation first reading for the design team. That's on the agenda later tonight for second reading. Uh, we anticipate that that will move forward. Uh, at the same time, we had proposed to bring the CM forward two weeks ago. And as Dr. Standish mentioned, mentioned we had three bids. There was a, a, a disparity between the numbers of the bids, and we felt as staff we needed to take the time, no different than any other bid, uh, that would have a discrepancy and ask questions. And so we did that. We spent the last two weeks asking questions. We uh, met specifically with the Hausman team, uh, asked questions. We actually even talked to the Samson team about their bids and, and clarifications on numbers. And so we spent time, legal counsel, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Gesford and Derek, uh, and myself and many staff. And so we spent a lot of time going through the process to make sure that the numbers were solid. And so with that, uh, as Dr. Standish mentioned, we would like to move forward because we have a lot of work to do between now and a bond issue. And so uh, be happy to answer any questions regarding the process, any of the uh, things that took place. Okay, I have Barb. <clears throat> um, Scott, first I'm gonna ask you to define the construction manager as constructor, um, uh, uh, the CEM position and what it does. And then I have a couple of questions after that. Okay. Two methods of construction typically our uh, LPS would use. One is a design bid build, where we hire an architect, design a project, put it out to bid. Uh, a month later, the bids are submitted and we take the low responsible bidder. And so the contractor is not involved at all during design. It's basically the owner and the architect. And so that may take several months and then it goes out to bid and we accept the results and sometimes the results could be over budget or under budget, but we uh, look at the numbers, digest them, and make a recommendation. In the construction manager pro uh, process, we hire the architect and the construction manager at the same time, like we are proposing now, so that the construction manager is actually at the table during the entire design process, allowing us to analyze systems, design, process, so that we have a better feel for what that number would be in, in so-called bid day. But in the CM at risk uh, process, we actually get a guaranteed maximum price before the end result of design. And that's an agreed upon time frame based on the owner and the architect and the CM. And so this just allows us to manage that budget a little more closely uh, by having that CM on board from day one. And, on a project of 100 million plus, like we're talking about here, that's pretty critical. If this were a $5 million project, we probably wouldn't use a CM on the project. And so that's the difference based on the magnitude. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, um, so the next thing that comes to mind to, for me is, uh, does LPS have the staff capacity to go and analyze um, the, uh, uh, information that comes about through this method of having a CM and the architect work together. 
I'm proud to say we have a very solid staff that can do that work. I mean, we have actually architects and engineers on staff. Uh, unlike other districts, I think we take this job seriously. Uh, I think we have a great history dating back to the 2006 bond issue and the subsequent 2014 bond issue of managing projects and construction and analyzing bids and the process throughout. So uh, I feel very confident in the team that we've assembled over the years, along with legal counsel and leadership like Dr. Standish. Uh, I think we really do a good job of analyzing. I would tend to agree very much so. So um, the thing that when I first saw this in my board book, I, I called you up and we, we talked about it. And what was bothering me was um, if uh, we award the CM contract to a certain company, does that mean that all the open bidding process is done? No. All of the all of the scope of the project is yet to be bid. And so we proposed in the invitation for bid five bid packages. And so they were well described in that document that the CMs uh, analyzed in their bid. And so if they wanted to bid on those packages themselves, they have the ability to do that based on a standard protocol that we've defined. So right now they're only guaranteed, so to speak, their fee and the general conditions amount that was proposed in the invitation. So other companies can continue to go through the open bidding process. That's, That's really important to me. Um, and, and, and then as I've learned more about this, I understand that this allows us to go and be able to save money for the district in and be good shepherds for the taxpayers' res, uh, uh, resources. Yes. Okay, that, that's um, the questions I have at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. I have Annie. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, was, I would like to kind of do some respectful following up on uh, Mr. Peterson's commentary. So I have a couple of questions on how he put uh, some questions he asked out there. One is, <clears throat> excuse me, his worry was that we should delay this to our next board meeting so that there could be conversation with staff. Um, have we not already delayed putting this in front of us for two weeks? Because was this not, my understanding with planning committee, this was planned to come two weeks ago with the architect. That's uh, correct. That, correct. So we've had two weeks already of time to take time to look at this and figure out what was going on, ask questions, and so forth, and others could ask us questions. Is that That's correct? That's correct. So we have taken some of that time. Um, um, the next question is, um, is there anything in our bidding process that says that one cannot just bid whatever price one wants to bid? I mean, if you want to bid, if I want to bid, I, I, I mean, obviously there's a process, but there's nothing in our process that says, the question was putting out characterization of a donation. And for, when the bid came in, when, we're, when they have an open bid and it goes out like that, it's the numbers are what the numbers are given to us by the companies and they've all been given the same amount of money, the same directions, correct? I think in general terms there is nothing that says that you can't, you don't have the right to bid whatever you want to bid. Now, obviously there's a lot more factors that play into that and no different than this bid. If we see uh, numbers that we don't feel overly comfortable with, we delay and we ask questions just like we did in this process. Um, it was referenced the zoo project tonight and that did have a line for a donation. LPS in past history, in my 20 years here, have never asked for a donation on any bid form and so um, that's not been our practice in the past. The zoo is a separate entity uh, that, you know, we're there because we are contributing money to their project. We don't that wasn't our project, so they had the choice to make that uh, ask or request in their proposal form. Um, then my next one is like, so your job, when we're looking at doing a big project, would you say in the most simplest way is to do it right, to do it on time, and to do it um, on budget? Would that be correct? I'd say that's a pretty simple summary of and a lot of other things. And a lot of other things. Yes. But my experience with you in planning is that is what our conversations are almost always about. And when you got these bids and we took the two weeks time, would you say that in those two weeks what you've been doing is trying to figure out if with this bid we would be doing it right on time and on budget? 
Is that, would that be correct? We spent a lot of time the last two weeks in discussions uh, trying to quantify and make sure that that was a good bid. That's correct. And that we have confidence in the Houseman Company in their bid and their ability to also be do it right on time and on budget. We have confidence in that company. Quite frankly, we have confidence in all three of the groups that proposed uh, on this, and so we know that all three could do the work, and Hausman happened to be the lowest bid. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Annie. I have Kathy and then Connie. So as I reviewed the bids, I looked at a wide disparity from half a million, a little more than half a million, all the way to 5.1 million. Explain to me how you vet the difference so you know that we are, we are purchasing the same thing no matter which one of these three uh, companies we select. Good question. Whenever we get bids, we always want to analyze the results to make sure that we feel confident in the low bid. Okay, and so let's just say all three of them were 2.27, 2.28, 2.29. On one hand, we feel very confident in what we provided them that the bids are really close. Okay, so in this case, when they're that far apart, we start to say, well, that's interesting. And so that starts the mind thinking about questions that need to be asked of all of those bidders. So which one is right? Is the low one right? Is the middle one right? Is the high one right? And I can't tell you exactly the mindset, the business model behind who makes that decision on game day when it's time to fill in the blank. Those are business decisions that those companies need to make. And so whether they want to bid high or low or pad their number or they want to under cut their number just due to whatever circumstances or whatever decisions they want to make. That's not on us, that's on them, like I said, on game day. When they are that far apart though, after the bid, we want to ask those questions because we're just not going to say, hey, we recommend because they're the low. If they would have all been very close, uh, we would have even probably interrogated them just as much because we would want to know why that number so tight and did you add something or forget something because that that could play into the decision as well regarding the recommendation so whether they're far apart or close we're going to look at it very closely in this case the uh, low bid that's why we spent the extra two weeks the high bid uh, i know for a fact that those were two companies that came together as a joint venture or a partnership to do this project. First time for them to take on a project of this scale. I don't know what their decision making process was to come up with that number, but that was their decision that they made. And so um, whether that's why they were that much higher than number two, I don't know that. That's a question we'd have to ask that, ask that bidder. And do you have a wide range of confidence that the parameters that we put in place in the bid process are going to be completely fulfilled with the low bidder in this and the recommendation of staff. I'm very confident, confident that it'll get done for the bid. And lastly, if we delayed this, what would be the outcome for our staff and for the projects as they're coming forward? We're aggressively meeting because this is a huge project and time is money as we, when we mentioned this several months ago, that's why we introduced it to you and, and got your approval with the process and so uh, we're meeting, we need to meet because of all the information that needs to be digested and the decisions that need to be made over the next several months. And were you, did you verify with the low bidder that they understood the scope of the project and were able to make those uh, uh, parameters? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Connie. Okay. Um, Kathy, you did answer one of mine. I'm just curious, I can't remember, who built our last two high schools? Uh, Samson Dunn built those two high schools. That's so correct. Samson both, built both of our last two high schools. Yeah, they did, a, they did a joint venture or partnership on both of those high schools. And who, who built Moore? Moore was built by Hausman. Okay. And so who, who built the district office here? I can't remember that either. This was built by Hampton. So that just happens to be all three that gave us the bids, right? Correct. So we have used all of these builders many times. We keep everything local, we do everything fairly. Yes, okay. all three are very qualified. Of course, I know they are. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Annie? Um, I'd just like to say that in the, having been on the planning committee for the last year, this is not a new subject matter to us. We've talked about doing um, the architect and the, the construction manager and what that means. 
And what I've learned from that process is like, as you have said, that because we're looking at a big project and a messy project, that this is the best way for us to move forward and to be, as Barb said, good shepherds of taxpayers' money. And um, the other thing is that there's been a lot of discussion in what our process involves and the steps that involve it. And there's been discussion. I just want to say that I feel that I, my questions of, of um, not just believing, but feeling that the information we've gotten has helped to, um, <coughs> to delineate, to understand that the process that we've used more than once has been followed. We use the same process when, I keep going back to vegetables, but we have had big disparities of when vegetables before too, from a low bidder to a high bidder. And these things happen um, because of the way our process happens. And just in talking with, in planning discussions and in looking through this and discussions with you and knowing the questions that have been asked, um, I'm just really confident that you have forwarded to us the best step forward and process in this, um, that this is not just something we have thought about in two weeks. This has been something that we have been considering, not the names, but the process for quite some time. So um, I have confidence that you have done your due diligence to put forward the name that um, we can have confidence in. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so one, as we look at this type of a process, uh, three words come to mind, lowest responsible bidder. And so in this case, we had three bidders. Uh, it's really easy to see from the numbers who's the lowest. So really, the, the complexity of it, it uh, revolves around responsible. Can you tell me a little bit about the process that you go through to uh, verify that a bidder is a responsible bidder? I think there's a number of things. I mean, the, the number is this one thing, but we look at history uh, in terms of past projects and performance on those projects. Uh, we talk to references of projects they've worked on that aren't LPS uh, to find that out. We, uh, we talk to bonding agents and companies and underwriters. Uh, we, we ask a lot of questions. Uh, we also ask questions of the, the bidder themselves. You know, it, we don't want to tap dance around them, we want to look them in the eye and have those very conversations um, and make sure that uh, they can answer the questions. And uh, if you've worked with us before, and, and both of these teams behind me will guarantee you that we're not an easy owner to work with. Uh, we have high expectations and we live by them and they know that. And so uh, we're looking out for tax dollars as you've all mentioned. And so uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that they're a responsible bidder. Okay. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and I appreciate you um, mentioning, asking the uh, bidders a question, because I, I have a question that I think really only the bidder can answer, and that question is, why is this bid lower than the other bids? And uh, if we have representatives from Hausman that could come forward and just answer that, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So Chad Wiles, I'll let him, and you might want to restate that. I sure will. But first, thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate your uh, participation in the bid process. And my question is, why is your bid lower than the other bids? Um, you know, as Scott mentioned, we, as a business, have to make business decisions based off of projects that come across, you know, our desk every single day. Um, this is a project that is going to change the landscape of Lincoln for years to come, and we know that. And we just really wanted to be a part of that uh, process. So. Uh, Joey and I had a conversation, you know, about a year ago because we knew that this was coming up and decided that uh, we weren't going to let anybody take this project from us. And, and it's so important to us that uh, we made that decision to turn in that hard bid. And we know that uh, we're confident in that number and we're, we're ready to provide the services that were required in the contract and the RFP that was put in front of us. Thank you so much. While you're up there, are there any questions, uh, other questions from board members on this? Okay. Thank you so much for uh, coming up and answering that question. Don. Uh, well, everybody else has been asking uh, all the questions that I was going to ask, so I'd have to say those were excellent questions. Uh, one of the, the things that I wanted to talk about was uh, the concept of time. I think under normal consideration or normal cir circumstances, taking a little bit more time uh, to consider something. Uh, could could seem sensible. Uh, as Annie pointed out, we've already had a delay on this. Uh, one of the things that I would point to is that when we have, uh, for our last two uh, bond elections, when we held the elections in February, um, one of the questions was, why are you doing that instead of just waiting until May? 
And the, uh, the, the uh, answer was that uh, by moving it up just those few months, we could end up saving millions and millions of dollars uh, because of uh, the way that it would work with losing a, a building season potentially. And I think that uh, we're on a very tight ship. I think we're very efficient uh, at what we do. And one of the reasons for that is because we make very good use of time. Uh, and so uh, if I am confident in our due diligence, the uh, idea of delaying uh, would cause me a significant amount of concern. Uh, so the question then is uh, with diligence, again, people have asked the uh, same kinds of questions that were on my mind. I think the bottom line is that we have uh, a satisfactory history with the bidder. Uh, staff is confident uh, that Hausman is responsible and does good work. Uh, and we will be getting quality work done from a responsible company at a uh, significant discount. And so what my question then uh, to Dr. Gesswood Ferd would be, uh, if I were inclined to make a motion to move this to approval tonight, uh, do you have language that you would recommend? Um, yes, uh, certainly we were prepared to go either way, whatever uh, the board's uh, ultimate desire might be, but if you are inclined to move it, uh, my recommendation would be I move to, number one, Suspend all LPS policies, regulations, and practices per board policy 8314. Two, move agenda item 9.2.2 to action. And three, to approve agenda item 9.2.2 and the proposal resolution and motion as set forth in the agenda materials for this meeting. That would be my recommendation that the motion how it be worded, and I can certainly provide a copy if it's your intent to uh, move this to action. Uh, no, that's good enough. I would just say I would like to move approval using that language. Okay. I have a motion. Is there a second? Barb. I second it. Is there further discussion or questions? All right. Thank you all very much for your excellent questions earlier. April, would you please call the roll on the motion to approve 9.2.2? Ms. Bumgarden? Yes. Dr. Ronner? Yes. Ms. Beyer? Yes. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Our next item of business is agenda item 9.2.3, <coughs> Community Learning Center Agreements. Staff has asked that we move this item to action tonight. Is there a motion for approval? Kathy? I would move approval set aside our, our policies and practices and regulations and move 9.2.3 to action and approve the Community Learning Center agreements with Boys and Girls Club, Lancaster County, Cedars, Lancaster County, uh, Cedars Youth Services, Family Service Association, Lincoln Housing Authority, Malone Community Center, Nebraskans for Civic Reform, Northeast Family Center, Willard Community Center, and YMCA. Barb? I second. Is there any discussion or questions on this item? Annie? Mr. Neal, I've asked you this question several times, um, but can you please refresh my memory on why there's a difference in, the, in what we are paying to each, each organization? Thank you for asking, because that's nice to be able to explain to people. There's a couple factors that play into the different amounts. One is that lead agency have a different number of sites that they serve, so part of it is just a function of scale. Additionally, the longer that you are have been receiving the 21st Century Learning Grant, that grant stair steps down, so an early recipient of the grant would be receiving more uh, grant fund through the district, so that contract would be larger. The longer you've been in that grant fund, the lower that amount would be. And uh, third, there are additional grants that lead agencies partner with the school district, and so those grants flow through as well as federal Title I dollars, and those are unique depending on the programming offered at those schools. So those three general factors create those differential amounts between the lead agency contracts. Okay, thank you. Okay, and also I apologize, Dr. Standish, I didn't give you an opportunity to your names on this item. <laughs> it actually should be um, Mr. Neal, so okay. it worked out just great. All right, fantastic. Uh, Kathy. So community learning centers for people that might be new to Lincoln have provided a huge uh, impact on the learning of students within the buildings that they serve. They've, they've leveled the playing field. We have verifiable data, which places all over the country say, how did you get data on after school programs? And I think that that verifiable data that students participate 
uh, do well on standardized tests and on classroom performance is valuable data in sustaining these programs. I'm always happy to bring uh, any of these to a vote. I'm always happy to support and approve any of these uh, community learning center projects. And I would tell our public, if you aren't using them, you should be, because they are truly an inspiration to the kids that they serve. Thank you, Kathy. Further questions or comments? Seeing none, April, would you please call the roll on the motion to approve item 9.2.3? Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Rahner? Yes. Ms. Byer? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Uh, next item of business is item 9.2.4, Project Prevent Federal Grant. Um, Matt. Thank you. Staff is seeking approval to apply to the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education of the U.S. Department of Education for a Project Prevent Grant. This application supports the district's strategic plan to support the academic success of all students through better mental health supports. Our application will complement current efforts underway and provide strategic activities at Lincoln High, Northeast, and North Star. Some of those activities would include professional development for clinicians. That group includes counselors, social workers, and school psychologists. We would be able to add one and a half clinicians per school to work on the development of a peer mediation program at each school. And we'd also be able to partner with community organizations to provide more mental health supports. I want to thank Dr. Hicks and Mr. Ewing for bringing this grant to our attention, and of course, Ann Caruso for her work in writing the grant application. Because of the application's due date, we would request that this be moved to second reading. Thank you. Staff has a request that we move this item to action tonight. Kathy? I would approve, move approval of the submission of the Project Prevent grant application for up to $480,000. Uh, and I, I believe we have to set aside our policies and regulations to do so. And that's part of the motion. Thank you, Kathy. Barb? I second that, and then I just want to make a comment. Absolutely, Barb. Uh, I just am um, very pleased to see that we're um, aggressively going out and seeking more resources on this huge need for um, more supports for our students and mental health. If there's one thing I hear uh, frequently from my teacher contact team, from students and from um, administrators, is that uh, mental, mental health needs are uh, a, a, a huge issue among our students these days. It's a challenging world to be growing up in, and we need to provide as much support as we can. So I just really commend um, staff for going and pursuing this grant. Thank you, Barb. Further questions or comments? All right, seeing none, April, would you please call the roll on the motion to approve item 9.2.4? Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Rahner? Yes. Ms. Byer? Yes. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Our next item of business is item 10.2.1, Architecture and Engineering Services for a New High School Concept Project. Is there a motion for approval of this item? Don? Move approval. Is there a second? Kathy? I would second that motion. Dr. Standish? Um, yes, before you this evening for approval, you have the Architect and Engineering Services for the new high school projects. And Clark Anderson, a local firm, um, is who we are recommending. We did have this at our last meeting. And um, just as I have a moment to thank Scott Wieskamp for his leadership um, through this process, his skills and expertise in helping us plan and use time well, um, save the district and the taxpayer millions of dollars. So I want to make sure I get that in this evening. Thank you, Dr. Standish. Uh, further uh, comments or questions? All right, seeing none, April, please call the roll on the motion to approve item 10.2.1. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Rahner? Yes. Ms. Byer? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes, thank you. Uh, that brings us down to informational items. Are there any board committees that wish to report tonight? All right. Seeing none, is there a report from the Career Academy? 
Uh, just that I'm looking forward to attending my first meeting still. Thank you. There is no report from the superintendent tonight. Are there any questions on the monthly financial report? Seeing none, that takes us down to announcements of upcoming events for the board. On June 27th, which is Thursday, we have a public budget forum at Lincoln North Star High School starting at 7 p.m. This will include an opportunity for public comment on the budget. On July 3rd, we have the Chamber Coffee at 8 a.m. A note that all LPS buildings will be closed on July 4th for the Independence Day holiday. On July 9th and July 23rd, we will not have a regular board meeting. On July 25th, we have LPS Leadership Day at Lincoln Southwest. And our next board meeting will be on the fifth Tuesday of July, which is July 30th, right here at 6 p.m. That brings us to our second opportunity for public comment. Would anyone wishing to speak to the board please come forward now? Seeing none, I do not have a request for a closed session tonight. There is, however, an ESU meeting immediately following this meeting. The LPS board is adjourned. I call to order this meeting of Educational Service Unit 18 for June 25th, 2019. April, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer? Here. Mr. Boswell? Present. Mrs. Danick? Here. Mrs. Duncan? Here. Mr. Mayhew? Present. Ms. Mungard? Here. Dr. Ronner? Present. I would uh, announce that the Open Meeting Act is posted at the back of the room. And we have one set of minutes for approval. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, those will stand as approved. Uh, that brings us to public comment. I do not have any little blue cards. Is there anyone who wishes to address ESU 18 board? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion? Lenny? Move approval of item uh, seven, the consent agenda. Is there a second? Annie? No, second that. Discussion? Seeing none, April, would you please call the roll? Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Ronner? Yes. Ms. Byer? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. We have no items for first reading this week. Uh, we do have a number of uh, policy uh, suggestions uh, from last week. Uh, let's start with Lanny. If there are no objections, I will begin uh, by moving approval of items 9.1.1, .1, .2, .3, .4, .5, .6, and 0 .7. and .7. Barb? I uh, second those. Any questions or comments? I saw Lanny first and Kathy. Just add these were uh, items on first reading at our last meeting and are the ESU equivalents of uh, policies for the LPS board. Kathy? I just wanted to thank John Neal for uh, listening last week and making the changes to the, I believe it's 8130 or is it 8230 on who sits on the committees yes uh, policy 8130 you'll notice there's a change in the first and third paragraph the first paragraph uh, uh, explains that the committees of LPS may also function as the committees for the ESU which is common practice but it makes it very clear for anyone that would look at our policies or want that authorization I will note the third paragraph, as always, once you start looking at policies, you start thinking, well, what else can we do with that as long as we're making a change? And paragraph three is one of those items. There had been a court case that defined the role of subcommittees of the board. So we added some explicit language at the recommendation from legal counsel that explains that and puts that in policy. And you'll see that same addition to the LPS version of 8130 that explains that committees may not hold hearings, make policy, or take formal action on behalf of the ESU board, the LPS policy limb represent uh, uh, LPS board, except for subcommittees specifically authorized by law or policy to do so. An example would be expulsion hearings are done by a subcommittee of the board. So you'll see that in a future board meeting for the LPS policy. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, April, would you please call the roll? Dr. Ratner? Yes. 
Ms. Byer? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Uh, that brings us to item 9.2.1, Interlocal Agreement with Lancaster County for Educational Services to the Youth Services Center. This was uh, up for first reading last meeting. Is there a motion? Annie? I move that we put forward 9.2.1. Connie? I'll second that. Comments or questions? Seeing none, April, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Browner? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. That brings us to item 9.2.2, the agreement with Nebraska Department of Education for the Southeast Nebraska Regional Programming for Hearing Impaired Students. Is there a motion, Kathy? I would move approval of the motion to board 9.2.2 uh, with the Nebraska Department of Education, and this is for our hearing impaired students. Uh, I looked the other way. Was that uh, a second, Connie? Yes, it was. I have a second that. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions? Seeing none, April, would you please call the roll? Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danick? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Ms. Byer? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. That brings us once again to public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board? Uh, seeing none, there is no request for a closed session, and we stand adjourned.